In this time of sacred struggle, in this time of sacrifice, we I want to begin with four questions. I'm going to pause briefly after each of the questions to enable you answer each question but in your mind. Don't overthink it. Whatever is the first answer that comes to mind, just keep that as your answer and prepare for the next question. Question number one. Who are you? Question number two. What does that answer mean to you? Question number three. How do you feel about that answer? Question number four. What do you do with your answer? Know yourself or man, know thyself is a common saying that has been attributed to various Greek philosophers. But the most common attribution is to Socrates. And the significance of the saying, man know thyself, is that self-knowledge is the foundation of all knowledge. It is only when you truly know yourself that you can confidently go on to know the other person or to know something else. As a human being, Jesus Christ also struggled with the question of self-knowledge and self-identity. Most likely, as a little child growing up, like any other child, he must have asked the Blessed Virgin Mary and Joseph many times questions regarding his identity. Probably, he was not satisfied with the answers he got from them. And that was why, at the age of 12, when he first got the opportunity of going to the temple, he remained behind to question the elders, to question those he felt knew better in order for him to know more about his identity. At the beginning of his public ministry, he got the answer loud and clear at his baptism when a voice came from heaven, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Yes, question number one, well answered. But remember, three other questions. What is the implication of that identity that has been revealed to him? So what does it mean to be the beloved son of God? How is he to feel about that? And what is he to do with that? So after his baptism, the spirit led him to the desert where he prayed and fasted 40 days and 40 nights to find out the implication of this identity that has been revealed to him. At the end of the 40 days and 40 nights, Satan showed up to help him with that question. You got that right? You are the son of God. Now let me tell you what it is. If truly you are the son of God, this is the implication. I dare you, command these stones to become loaves of bread, and then you can satisfy your hunger, and that will really prove that you are the Son of God. 
And Jesus said, One does not live on bread alone, but on the word that comes from the mouth of God. And the devil usually does not give up. Then he came with the second one. Now, I get something, have something better for you here now. You are the son of God, right? Let me tell you the best way to prove it. You see, we go to the temple, from the top of the temple, just jump down you know, like Superman. And then, you know what? You just said that you rely on the word of God, right? Now, let me take you back to the word of God. Open your Bible. Psalm 91, verse 11 and verse 12 says, that the Lord will command his angels. He will give them charge over you, and they will support you and your foot. Nothing will happen to you when you drop on the ground. But Jesus showed his superiority by telling Satan, you know what? Even if you have the powers, you are not expected to put yourself in the way of danger because God has given you the power or as a way of testing God. And so, Jesus was done with two out of three of the temptations. And that is how the devil operates. Our talents, our identity, form the ingredients with which the devil tempts us. The devil begins by giving the right identification of our identity and our talents. But when it comes to the interpretation, then the devil begins to twist it in order to derail us and get us into trouble. In today's first reading, just right after God gave Adam and Eve the wonderful gift of the Garden of Eden, Satan came immediately to use the same gift to tempt them. The very fruit that God asked them not to eat, Satan was there to identify it as a gift from God, but not to twist it in terms of what it should be used for. Many scripture scholars have tried to explain what really happened in the Garden of Eden. Some have gone to the extent of saying that the ban placed on that, that the instruction from God not to eat the forbidden fruit was not meant to be a permanent one, that it was just temporary, that it was just for a time, and then a time would come when God would permit them to eat. And so the role the devil played in the Garden of Eden was to tell them, to tell Adam and Eve to play by their own calendar and not by God's calendar. That it should be either now or now. Either, it is either my way or the highway. And that was what got them into trouble. But in the case of Jesus, he did not play by his own calendar. He played by the timetable of his Father in heaven. And so, the same Jesus who would not change stone to loaves of bread, when it was time appointed by the Father, the same Jesus would multiply loaves to feed the multitudes. The same Jesus who would not jump down from the top of the temple when it was time appointed by his father, he would walk on water to teach his apostles to strengthen their faith to save them from natural disaster. Jesus did not come to show off. Jesus came to use his powers to save us. For the, tenth, the, the third temptation, Satan came to Jesus again and said, if only you bow to me, I promise you, I will give you all that you see here. Promising him political powers, promising him the world that does not even belong to Satan. But Jesus would not take that. When the appointed time came in Matthew chapter 28 after the resurrection of Jesus, 
Jesus would say to his apostles and disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me by my Father. And so now I send you to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And I'll be with you until the end of the ages. Satan promised Jesus only things of this world. But when Jesus waited on the time of his father, he got both heaven and earth. Adam and Eve were tempted based on the, uh, on the talents, on the gifts that God has given to them. Jesus was tempted based on his identity, based on his powers. The same applies to us. The devil is still out to bring us down based on our talents, based on our identities. If you are a man, I dare you to drive and drink, or to drink and drive. <laughs> if you are a man, I dare you to go take some drugs, and after that, go and drive. If you are a man, I dare you to go beat up your wife. If you are truly beautiful, I dare you to seduce that man. If you are truly wealthy, if you are a rich man, I dare you to go and falsely accuse that poor man and take him to court and send him to prison. And that is how the devil begins. If you know you are this, I dare you to do that. But the church fathers would say, that on no account should we obey the devil, even when the devil is asking us to do the right thing. For the end will always be disaster. The powers that God has given to us are not for us to show off with. God has empowered us in order to help those who are not as fortunate as we are. Jesus was out to use or to look to understand his identity, to view his identity, not through his own eyes, not through the eyes of the devil, but through the eyes of God. And that was why he was victorious in all the temptations. And so the questions I asked at the beginning of the homily, in answering them, we must always ask for the help of the Holy Spirit to enlighten us to know who am I, what does it mean? How should I feel about it? And what should I do with my identity? St. John Chrysostom says that the lesson, one great lesson from the temptations of Jesus is that the biggest temptation we face as human beings is the longing for more. As long as we are not satisfied with what we have now, then it becomes easier for the devil to derail us and get us into trouble. You can tell a rich person from a poor person, not based on how much that they have now, but based on how much more they want. At the end of the temptations, the angels came to comfort Jesus. And so for us, my dearly beloved in Christ, we we'll learn a lesson from Jesus today on how to overcome the devil when the devil comes with temptations. And as we do that, we do that with the hope that at the end of our sojourn here on earth, the angels will also come to welcome us and to applaud us through the same Christ our Lord. Amen.